morning, everybody, and welcome to Newcastle upon Tyne Unitarians this uh, Sunday morning, first Sunday in May. It's lovely to see you all. Whether you're joining us in the building here or online, you are very welcome. I'm going to begin with our value statement. Here at Newcastle Unitarians, we welcome all who seek the meaning of life and who believe that human spirituality is wider than any one tradition and deeper than any one set of opinions. With a respect for our Christian origins, we seek to explore all truths from all sources. Our fellowship gives us strength and encouragement in daily living. So welcome everybody. Um, my name's Diana, in case you don't know me, I'm a member of the congregation here. Um, and as we've just had King Charles III's coronation, I thought we'd look a little bit at him, um, but in particular, uh, I want to use this as a platform to look at his attitude to the environment. First, I'm going to light our chalice with some of his own words. The future of mankind can be assured only if we rediscover ways in which to live as a part of nature not apart from her, in Charles III. A poem by Archibald Lampman from 1895, Voices of Earth. We have not heard the music of the spheres, the song of star to star, but there are sounds more deep than human joy and human tears that nature uses in her common rounds. The fall of streams, the cry of winds that strain the oak, the roaring of the sea's surge, might of thunder breaking afar off, or rain that falls by minutes in the summer night. These are the voices of Earth's secret soul, uttering the mystery from which she came. To him who hears them, grief beyond control, or joy inscrutable without a name, wakes in his heart thoughts bedded there, impearled before the birth and making of the world. Voices of Earth by Archibald Lampton. I'm going to share some words now by Hildegard of Bingen. She was a mystic and polymath, I suppose. Um, she was a 12th century German. Uh, she was an abbess and she was, she's considered a green prophet in a way. And these are words from her. The earth is our mother, mother of all that is natural, all that is human. She is the mother of us all, for she contains within herself the seeds of all. The earth contains all moistness, all verdancy, all germinating power. It is fruitful in so many ways. The earth is our mother. Hildegard von Bingham. I'm now going to invite Ben up to read a speech that Charles gave in 2019 at the launch of a Netflix series entitled Our Planet. I must say, I often wonder why we've waited so long to take the actions we were so evidently required to do. 50 years ago, as it happens, about the same time I made my first speech about the environment, Spaceflight Apollo 8 took Earthrise, the photograph that showed for the first time the incomparable beauty and fragility of our planet. Surely one might have thought we would have known then the responsibility we had, that we had to do what we had to do, and the perilous path along which we were treading. 
But since that time, we have cleared 50% of the world's rainforests, destroyed 50% of our coral reefs, poisoned our rivers, and indeed whole swathes of the ocean with the runoff from industrialized agriculture. And we have dumped hundreds of millions of tons of plastic into the oceans as well. And of course, in doing so, we have instigated the world's sixth mass extinction event and have accelerated CO2 emissions to the extent that climate change is now a very real existential threat to our whole civilization. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Anthropocene, an epoch formed by the impact of man, and perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest crime of all is that we knew what we were doing. Informed consent being the basis of democracy, should we not reject informed destruction as the basis of catastrophe? And it appears that we have only belatedly, partially and somewhat reluctantly come to the realization that our planet does not refer to the hour of Homo sapiens, but rather to the whole astounding miracle of life on Earth. We share it equally, and as is becoming only too obvious, for our own survival, we desperately need the rest of the natural world, with which we are intimately in interconnected, but which we have been taught to exploit and dominate as something separate from ourselves. My sons are both keen to remind me that we know what the problem is. We no longer need permission to act, but the priority is now to focus urgently on finding and implementing solutions. It is also glaringly obvious as we look around our world that these solutions need to heal the environment and our society. There is much though about which we can be hopeful. We can change our behavior, we can embrace a circular economy, we can embrace renewable energy, we can make soil health the basis of our agriculture, we can meet the sustainable development goal targets on the oceans and forests, we can regenerate and restore our degraded landscapes, we can ensure that investment reflects the risks inherent in destroying natural capital as well as in climate change and we can ensure that the infrastructure on which some 90 trillion dollars is to be spent in the next 20 years is zero carbon and enhances the lives of those who depend upon it so not only ladies and gentlemen do we have the solutions we also have the money in other words, the cost of keeping to 1.5 degrees of warming are relatively small and the benefits are enormous, whereas the costs of not doing so are utterly catastrophic. So what I want to know is how can we possibly sacrifice our children's and grandchildren's entire future let alone the future of all life on this miraculous planet, by not doing what we know is required now. And these self-same children and grandchildren are already raising their voices and demanding action as you've probably all seen. So, ladies and gentlemen, we can do all of these things because we must. And by doing them, we will invest in technologies and activities that will secure employment and prosperity. Climate change and biodiversity loss are not only going to wreak havoc on future generations, they are starting to wreak havoc on us already. Particularly and tragically on the poorest and most vulnerable. And we have no choice but to be the change we need, for there is nobody else. And for that to happen, as many people as possible across all cultures and languages must understand the natural world and our place within it. We are nature ourselves. 
our planet will be a critical part of that process and I hope and pray that it will catalyze an enduring determination to cherish and protect the earth, our only home. That was Charles speaking in 2019 at the launch of the Netflix series, Our Planet. There's nothing like a jolly good disaster to get people to start doing something. It's another quotation from Charles. I'm not actually a massive fan of monarchy. Um, and after watching yesterday's coronation, I think I'm even less so. Um, although I think figureheads are important, if not essential. Uh, monarchy, I find, is something of a roulette wheel. You get what you get, and it's really just luck whether they're good at their job or not. Um, although I wouldn't say democracy necessarily has a much better track record. But yesterday's coronation was still a significant moment. There will only ever be one coronation of King Charles III, whatever your view. And I feel that there's a lot of wisdom from Charles to be had if we choose to listen and see past some of the mistakes and inevitable hypocrisy. So Charles, Charles Philip Arthur George was born on the 14th of November, 1948 at Buckingham Palace. He is King of the United Kingdom and 14 other Commonwealth realms. He was three when his mother Elizabeth II acceded to the throne in 1952. He was made Prince of Wales in 1958 and his investiture was held in 1969. He succeeded his mother on her death on the 8th of September 2022 and at the age of 73 he is the oldest person to accede to the British throne after having been the longest serving heir apparent and Prince of Wales in British history. His coronation took place yesterday and I think no matter your views on monarchy, he does have a hard act to follow. His mother had the longest reign of any British monarch, which was 70 years and 214 days. And it was the longest verified reign of any female head of state in all of history, which I think is an achievement. She was a massively respected woman. And so I think Charles does have a difficult job uh, looking a little bit at yesterday's coronation, um, a few things that were mooted didn't really happen. Um, so it's quite interesting to see. Uh, they were hoping that he might not spend quite so much money. <laughs> uh, quite a lot of money was spent and a lot of it was taxpayers' uh, money. So this is why I'm a little bit uh, hesitant now to say that I'm, um, well, I'm even more reluctant to say I'm a fan of monarchy. I'm really not. Um, so the King's coronation was, was going to be rooted in long-standing traditions and pageantry while also reflecting the monarch's role today and looking towards the future. Camilla was crowned queen alongside him. Uh, this hasn't happened, there hasn't been a queen consort since 1937. Um, and also we had a lot fewer guests. King Charles' guest list was only 2,000 compared with Queen Elizabeth's over 8,000. And instead of a four hours, it was just one hour for the ceremony. Uh, he wasn't expected to wear full ceremonial robes. So when I said this last week at Stockton, uh, I was saying he's just going to be in his military uniform and then he wasn't. Uh, so he, he did actually stick to quite a lot of traditions um, unexpectedly, including the use of the ceremonial coach. Which one is it? The gold coach, which took 400 books of gold leaf to cover. Uh, at Queen Elizabeth's coronation, all the dukes in attendance knelt before her and swore allegiance, whereas this time it was just Prince William, uh, Charles's oldest son and the heir apparent now. And instead of a two hour journey passing 16,000 individuals, uh, which was what occurred at Queen Elizabeth's coronation, uh, the king this time only took a much, much shorter journey passing far fewer people, although the parade was extremely impressive. It was very well synchronized with thousands of people all marching to the same beat across a couple of miles. Very impressive. So that's the coronation. I'm going to move on from Charles as such um, and talk more about his attitude to the environment, which is what I really want this to be about. Charles has long been a proponent of sustainability and support of the environment and nature well before it was a mainstream view. 
His actions can be viewed as a bit hypocritical sometimes. He is a long, long way from a perfect example of how to live sustainably and in harmony with the earth, given his lifestyle and privilege. But as Ben pointed out to me a few weeks ago, his position does give him a platform from which to give voice to a growing important movement. Another quotation from him, he said, I've had this extraordinary feeling for years and years, ever since I can remember really, of wanting to heal and make things better. I feel more than anything else, it's my duty to worry about everybody and their lives in this country, to try to find a way of improving things if I possibly can. Clarence House has solar panels and biomass boilers. Charles even had his Aston Martin converted to run on a mixed fuel of waste wine, whey from cheese and petrol. He's a vocal supporter of organic farming methods and useful architectural design, which led him to support the construction of the experimental town of Poundbury in Dorset, which is an integrated community built around people rather than the car. It's a place that tries to encourage people to support their environment as much as possible by living sustainably, walking or cycling everywhere, uh, living, working and shopping locally so that there's less reliance on public transport or industry. Charles loves gardening. He advocates talking to your plants, saying that I happily talk to the plants and trees and I listen to them. I think it's absolutely crucial. His healing garden, based on sacred geometry and ancient religious symbolism, went on display at the Chelsea Flower Show in 2002. If you can see an order of service near you, uh, you might be interested to note the symbolism on the coronation invite, which is on the top. If you can see a colour one, you'll be able to see it even better. The design was printed on recycled card with gold foil detailing. Uh, central to the design at the bottom, you'll see the green man. It's an ancient figure from British folklore, symbolic of spring and rebirth to celebrate the new reign. The shape of the green man crowned in natural foliage is formed of oak, ivy and hawthorn leaves, emblematic of the United Kingdom. There's a British wildflower meadow bordering the invitation, which features lily of the valley, cornflowers, wild strawberries, dog roses, bluebells, and rosemary for remembrance, presumably for his mother, um, together with wildlife, including a bee, butterfly, ladybird, a wren, and a robin. Some of the flowers are grouped in threes, particularly with one of them as a bud to symbolize uh, being the third Charles and at the start of his reign. Uh, two years ago, he launched something called the Terra Carta, something also known as the Earth Charter. And you'll see the seal of it on your um, order of service again, Bottom left, bottom right hand corner, that's the seal. This is a sustainable finance charter that asks its signatories to follow a set of rules towards becoming more sustainable and to make investments in projects and causes that help with preserving the env environment. So Charles does try, has tried to use his considerable leverage to push us as individuals, but also big business in the right direction. He's a man who has clearly had enough of talking and of hearing other people talk a lot, but do very little. He has also said, do we want to go down in history as the people who did nothing to bring the world back from the brink in time to restore the balance when we could have done? I don't want to. For when it comes to the air we breathe and the water we drink, there are no national boundaries we all depend on each other and, crucially, on each other's actions for our weather, our food, our water and our energy. He's a man who also encourages us to think of and listen to the next generations when we're deciding how to act. He says, if you think about your and my grandchildren, this is what really worries me. I don't want them if I'm still alive by then, to say, why didn't you do something about it when you could have done? We're busily wrecking the chances for future generations at a rapid rate of knots by not recognising the damage we're doing to the natural environment, bearing in mind 
that this is the only planet that we know has any life on it. If your children want to alter society, listen to their reasons and the idealism behind them. Don't crush them with some clever remarks straight away. So we need to act and act now. We as individuals do have a part to play, continued inaction in our daily lives, or actions based on indifference or apathy uh, globally do add up to big problems. But conversely, if we each try to live more sustainably, the work adds up. Personally, I do try very hard to walk and use public transport where I can and to not use my cars much. Yes, cars, I do have two. I have a stupidly high performance car, which is utterly pointless and I don't drive very often. And I try my best to live sustainably as well as I can. I do things like buy refills of toiletries and groceries rather than buy yet more plastic bottles and bags and I recycle what I can. But really, as individuals, that alone is spitting into the wind. Big corporations have the largest role here. And given our reliance on capitalist economies, changes here are like steering a tanker. But they are necessary for useful, lasting change. Charles is also aware that action based on our current attitude towards the planet as a resource to be used and abused will not serve us in the long run. What he wants to see is a humanity that cares for the planet again. He wants to see us reconnect to nature, to see ourselves as part of the whole instead of as some supreme species that can do what it likes. He said, the mistake is to think that clever technology can solve everything. It can't solve our relationship with nature, which is where I think it's gone wrong in that we have somehow abandoned our proper connection with nature. Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh was asked once what we need to do to save our world. And his response was, what we most need to do is to hear within us the sound of the earth crying. Uh, I'd like to thank Louise for lending us this book. Um, this is this is the church copy. So if anyone else would like to borrow it and read it, do feel free. Um, it's entitled Cherishing the Earth, Nourishing the Spirit. Um, it's a collection of essays uh, and short pieces um, put together by various Unitarian writers. Um, and this is by the this is a little piece by the editor herself, Maria Curtis. The ecological crisis is multifaceted and it requires us to open our hearts and minds to hear the cry of the earth, but also to hear the cry of those of our fellow human beings who are most affected by it, those who struggle every day just to survive. Rather than closing off defensively from others, we need to open our hearts and minds to the plight of other human beings and the flora and fauna of the planet. We need to create opportunities for the most vulnerable to have a voice and cultivate a listening ear to enable us to empathize with their life experience. She said as well that we've had the agricultural and industrial revolutions, and now we need another revolution if we are to make the transition necessary to save the planet. We need a shift in consciousness, an awareness of a deeper unity connecting us. Our duties to future humans, to animals and to the environment need to come together as a whole system in a way that's not been done before. We need to adapt our morality, which was formed for a different world and extend our compassion beyond the tribe, out towards others who may be very different from us. We need to see everything in global terms, pursuing justice on a global scale. We need a change of heart. We need to care. And this is a view that's echoed by Charles, by Charles himself. 
another thing that he said, the sustainability revolution will hopefully be the third major social and economic turning point in human history, following the Neolithic revolution and the industrial revolution. He wants to see sustainability become how we behave day to day. But the only way we're going to do that is if we want to, by caring for the planet. Let's take a moment to pray. Divine spirit of compassion, we humbly open ourselves to your loving grace. Fill our hearts and minds with your wisdom. Help us to see the right path and to choose it. May our daily needs be met so that we are free to love without boundaries. May we be grateful for the gifts of the earth and responsible for her care. May we forgive ourselves and others when we constrain our love or cause harm. Acknowledging our human frailty, we ask for strength at testing times. May the power of love reign supreme. So be it. Prayer by Maria Curtis. Going back to what Charles said in his, in his 2019 speech, we have no choice but to be the change we need, for there is nobody else. And for that to happen as many people as possible across all cultures and languages must understand the natural world and our place within it. We are nature ourselves. And I hope and pray that it will catalyze an enduring determination to cherish and protect the earth, our only home. I hope that we feel inspired to feel a connection to nature, to our planet, because without that connection and without that sense of compassion for her and for other, for other flora, fauna and human beings on the planet, how will we care for her and protect her and ensure our continued survival and thriving as well? <coughs> I'm going to end with a final quotation from Charles as I extinguish our chalice. Just as mankind had the power to push the world to the brink, so too do we have the power to bring it back into balance. King Charles III. <laughs>